Hello boys and girls, Mr. Walk here. I'm just excited to have the opportunity to speak to you uh, and read to you. I want to thank Ms. Piccolini for putting together such a wonderful reading opportunity for our children. Uh, we miss you. We know that this has not been an easy time uh, and it's been difficult for us to connect. So this is an opportunity for us to connect with you through reading. So what better opportunity than that? Um, boys and girls, with that said, I hope you're doing well. I hope your families are staying safe and we're eagerly awaiting your return. So uh, I'm going to read a book to you that I read at our read aloud night, um, but not everybody gets the opportunity to see it or to hear it. Uh, and I, it's one of my favorite. Uh, I think it's a very good message and it reminds all of us that sometimes we're nervous, but we're nervous for all the wrong reasons. And sometimes we get ourselves a little bit worked up uh, which is normal right now, but sometimes we worry when we really don't need to. And we build things up in our mind uh, when in reality uh, things aren't what they seem. So with that said, I'd like to read to you The Principal from the Black Lagoon. It's the third day of school and I've been sent to the principal's office. What a bummer. I hear the principal, Mrs. Green, is a real monster. Kids go to her office and they never come back. The waiting room is supposed to be filled with bones and skeletons. Doris Foodle was sent for chewing gum and they say her skeleton still has a bubble in its mouth. I walk in, I take a seat, and the rug is red. Oh, that's so the blood won't show. I hear she uses tall kids as coat racks. She uses the shorter kids to feed to her pet alligator, and the bigger ones she uses as paperweights. The thinner ones she uses as bookmarks. I'm too young to be a bookmark. Then, there's her 12-foot paddle. It's supposed to have poison spikes on it. If you're lucky, you get put in the cages. Well, she has them under her desk. But if you're really lucky, you get sent home in chains. But most kids, she keeps for her experiments. Derek Bloom was sent here yesterday, and they say he wound up with the head of a dog. Well, they say Freddie Jones has the feet of a chicken, and Eric Porter, the hands of a hamster. Well, I'm too good-looking to have ears of a rabbit. All I did was snatch Mrs. Jones' wig. It's very quiet today. Usually they say there's a lot of screaming. Well, maybe she's in a good mood. Even if I survive this, this will affect my whole life. In the future, I'll be running for president. I'll be ahead in the polls, and then it will come out. I can see the headlines now. Presidential candidate sent to principal's office. Uh-oh, there's a shadow at the glass. Now I am in the jaws of fate. The door slowly opens. Well, there's a pretty woman standing there, and she's the master of disguise. Come in, Yubi. I go in, and she closes the door behind me. I look around. There's only the coat rack. It doesn't look like anyone I know. I look around for the alligator, but there's only a turtle. It does look a little bit like Randy Potts. Now, says Mrs. Green, are we having a little trouble in class? Well, well says I, I, I was sweeping up the room, and, and by accident, Mrs. Jones' wig got, did get caught in the, in, in the broom handle. Well, we'll have to apologize, won't we? Y yeah, yes, we will. And the next time, we'll have to be more careful. Y yeah, yes, we, we will. Yes, we will. 
Now run along. Is that all? Close the door. Boy, was I lucky. Those flowers on our desk were probably poisonous. Just one whiff and you would turn purple. Fortunately, I did hold my breath. I went into her cave and I returned without the ears of a rabbit. I have to sweep her office sometime and she, is, she wears a wig. So boys and girls, things aren't always what they appear. And right now, uh, there's a lot on your plate. We're thinking about you, we miss you, and we hope that something like this gives you an opportunity to reconnect with me as the principal and all of the other staff members who are taking time out of their day to send you a little message through literature. Stay safe, stay warm, we love you and we miss you, and we look forward to your return. Hi everyone, it's Mrs. Peterson. I wanted to share a fabulous book that I read. It's called One Word for Kids, a great way to have the best year ever. Here we go. It was the first day of school and Stevie was falling asleep. He was tired and grumpy and sad that summer was over. But his ears perked up when his teacher, Miss B, said, I believe there is one word that will help you have your best year ever. It will be so great you'll enjoy it even more than summer vacation. Stevie's friend, Ellie, raised his hand and asked, what word is that? The word will likely be different for everyone, Miss B said. I have a special assignment for each of you. It's to find your own word for the year. So how do we find it, Stevie's classmate, Jimmy asked. I will help you, but I want you to try to discover it on your own first, Miss B answered. That night, while having dinner with his family, Stevie wouldn't talk or eat. When his mom asked, what's wrong? He told her about the one word assignment. He was sad because he had no idea how to find his one word. They're all like, hmm. Okay. Maybe your one word is annoying, said his sister, Kaylee shouted. I think it should be negative, his sister Jade yelled. Come on, girl, Stevie's dad quickly responded. Stevie, maybe you should think about some things you love to do or your favorite places to go. Maybe you'll find your one word there. That night, Stevie went to bed and thought about his favorite places and things he loved to do, hoping he'll find his one word. Fun, maybe my one word is fun. Love, maybe my one word is love. Maybe my one word is kind. He's cooking with grandma, love that. Maybe my one word is smile, love the ice cream. Maybe my one word is strong. Maybe my one word is brave. Maybe my one word is fast. The next morning, Stevie woke up excited. He was still thinking about all the words he could choose. Fun, strong, fast, kind, brave, smile, love. When school started, Miss B said, I have great news for all of you. Today, I'm going to give you the secret to finding your one word. You don't find it, it finds you. And I'm going to give you three easy steps to discover it and live it. What's the first step, Abby yelled. The first step is look into your heart, Miss B said. Ask yourself, what is your one, what one word will help me be my best? The second step is to look up, Miss B said Miss B. Look up and around and believe that there is one word meant for you. If you're open to it, it will come to you. What's the third word, Cole asked. That comes after you know your one word, Miss B. What's the, what's the third step, Cole asked. That comes after you know your one word, Miss B answered. I'll tell you that step soon, but first, who's ready to discover their one word? The students cheered, strong, believe, better, smile, amazing, family, fun, friends, give, thankful, love, brave, happy, kind, hope, heart, 
On the bus home, Stevie thought about the first step. He thought about the words that would help him be his best. As Stevie, as Stevie walked off the bus, he waved to his friends, George, and said goodbye to Miss Joy, the bus driver. Thank you, sugar. I love how po positive you are today, Miss Joy said. That night, Stevie walked his dog, Huxley. He thought about the possible, his, all the possible words. He looked up and remembered Miss Joy said what Miss Joy said to him as he got off the bus. In that moment, his one word came to him, positive. He remembered how grumpy he had been when the su summer was over. Miss B said his one word would help him have his best year ever. He now knew his one word was positive and he couldn't wait to tell everyone. Stevie ran home and told his family, positive. The next day, Stevie walked into school feeling good that he discovered his one word. All right, class, today is the day. Tell me your words, Miss, Miss B said. Strong, Grace shouted out. My one word is strong. John said, mine is grow. Joy, mine is joy. My one word is win, Jake said. Mine is care, Dawn said. Courage, Xavier said. One word, Elsie said, my one word is believe. Mine is faith, Catherine said. Class, I am so proud of you, each and every one of you, Miss B said. Here is the best part. The third and last step is to look and live your one word. On the bus ride home, Stevie was extra positive with Miss Joy. At soccer practice, Stevie encouraged his teammates and even shared the one word idea with his coach. His coach loved the idea and shared it with the team. Roar! At home, he was even positive with his sisters. Stevie lived his one word the entire year. And on the last day of school, he realized Miss B was right. He had the best year ever and even better than summer vacation. Positive, thank you, thankful. The, if the one word can help Stevie, think about what one word can help for you, can do for you. So what is your one word? I give you a little challenge. I'm curious to know what your one word would be. My family and I, we wrote down a couple words that we want to go by this year. And I would like to hear what your one word is. So if you want to share with that with me or share it with your family, that would be great. This is a fun book. You can take it out of the library. See you soon. Hi, boys and girls. This is Miss Magical. Today I'm going to read How to Catch the Tooth Fairy written by Adam Wallace and illustrated by Andy Elkerton. I hope you like it. All is quiet. All is still. The clock shows 3.09. The bell goes off. I'll go to work, cause now's my time to shine. I'm the Tooth Fairy. Yes, I am. And every single night I collect 300,000 teeth while staying out of sight. My travels take me far and wide. My life is such a blast. But please don't try to catch me, for I'm really much too fast. At Nancy Caton's, I recall an important fairy rule. While you're taking someone's tooth, watch out for all their drool. Oh, yuck. <laughs> Johnny Withers sets a trap. He wants me in a box. I'll take his tooth and then for fun, I'll hide all of his socks. <laughs> and the box says, Fairy Catcher. Cotton candy? Love this stuff. But 
I won't try to eat it. Every trap that's set for me is sure to be defeated. <laughs> Julie has a good idea, a trap made out of floss. I'll get her tooth, then leave a coin to pay her for her loss. <laughs> As I fly to Taylor's bed, I notice something scary. But once I've tied it all in knots, I'm feeling rather merry. Looks like Taylor tried to leave a Venus flytrap for that tooth fairy. This trap is good. I'm quite impressed. It nearly did me in. But I've got golden fairy dust. I'll never let you win. The ooey gooey catapult fires marshy mellow yum. It doesn't catch me, but it does just slightly stick my bum. Oh goodness. <laughs> the lights are off in Sarah's room and traps are everywhere. I'll need to do my very best to fly safe out of there. And then her goggles make a click sound. Now Sanjeev is creative. He's made a special cage. Am I no more? Is this the end? You better turn the page. Uh, all right, let's listen to the tooth fairy. She said, turn the page. Uh, look at that picture. So important to look at the illustrations, boys and girls. Wow. And then at last, I'm home again. The teeth are safe and sound. The kid who'll catch me in a trap is still yet to be found. Can you catch the tooth fairy? The end. I bet you could, boys or girls. So I hope you enjoyed this story. And until next time, see you later. Hey, everybody. Today I'm going to read for you the story, The Girl Who Never Made Mistakes. And I hope that by the end of the story, you learn something about making mistakes. For Beatrice Bottomwell, Friday began like any other day. She matched her socks and of course she put her shoes on their proper feet. She remembered to feed her hamster Humbert his favorite food, broccoli. And when she made a sandwich for her brother Carl's lunch, she used exactly the same amount of peanut butter as jelly. When she stepped outside to greet her fans, she didn't forget to say good morning and thank you. They asked if she made her bed. She had. They asked if she forgot to do her math homework. Nope. What about tonight's talent show, they asked. I'm ready, said Beatrice, with a smile. After all, her juggling act had won three years in a row. Most people in town didn't even know Beatrice's name. They just called her the girl who never makes mistakes because for as long as anyone could remember, she never did. Unlike Beatrice, Carl made lots of mistakes. He ate his crayons and drew with his green beans. He danced with his hands and played piano with his feet. Carl loved to make mistakes. At school, Beatrice was on a cooking team with her two best friends, Millie and Sarah. To make their giant rhubarb muffins, they needed four eggs. Beatrice went to the refrigerator and carefully chose the biggest, eggiest eggs she could find. 
but the, on the way back, her legs slipped out from under her. The eggs went flying. Beatrice was about to make her first mistake. But she didn't. That was close, thought Beatrice. Sorry, Beatrice, I dropped a piece of rhubarb. Uh, don't mention it. For the rest of the school day, Beatrice could not stop thinking about her almost mistake. On her way home from school, Beatrice watched Millie and Sarah ice skating in the park. Come join us, said Millie. It's fun, said Sarah. Beatrice watched them slip and slide on the frozen pond. Millie and Sarah laughed as they wobbled on the ice. No thanks, said Beatrice. At supper, Beatrice barely touched any of her food. Is everything all right, kiddo, her father asked. I'm worried I'll mess up tonight, said Beatrice, and everyone will be watching. Worry? You don't make mistakes, he said with a smile. Beatrice tried to smile too. After supper, Beatrice got ready for the talent show. First, she woke up Humbert from his nap. Next, she got the salt shaker from the kitchen table. Finally, she filled a balloon with water. The school auditorium was packed. Beatrice felt her stomach jumping around inside her. Beatrice waited for her juggling music to begin. That's her, that's the girl who never makes mistakes said a woman. Oh, well, we know she'll be perfect, said a man. When the music started, she tossed Humbert into the air. Next, she added the salt shaker and finally the water balloon. Beatrice didn't miss a beat. The crowd clapped with delight, but Beatrice noticed something odd about the salt shaker. The specks falling out of it were not white. Humbert was so surprised by his sneeze that he grabbed the water balloon with his claws. Kablooey! Humbert, pieces of water balloon, and the pepper rained down on top of Beatrice. For the first time in as long as anyone could remember, Beatrice made a mistake, and it was a big one. The music stopped. Beatrice didn't know what to do. Cry? Run off stage? The crowd sat stunned. They couldn't believe that the girl who never makes mistakes made a mistake. Beatrice looked up at Humbert. He looked back at her. His hamster fur was soaked and speckled with bits of balloon. Beatrice let out a giggle. The giggle grew into a chuckle, and the chuckle became a laugh. The people in the crowd looked at each other, and then back at Beatrice. They began to giggle, then chuckle, then finally roar with laughter. Beatrice and the audience laughed until they couldn't remember why they were laughing. That night, Beatrice slept better than she ever had. In the morning, no fans greeted Beatrice. When she got dressed, Beatrice, for no reason at all, put a polka dot sock on one foot and a plaid sock on the other. Beatrice and Carl made sandwiches. This time they put the peanut butter and jelly on the outside. They called it an inside out PB and J. Lunch was messy and delicious. Later, Beatrice found Millie and Sarah skating in the park. They fell a lot and laughed. Now people no longer called her the girl who never makes mistakes. They just called her Beatrice.
I hope you learned something about what it means to make a mistake. What did you learn? Hi, boys and girls. I would like to read you a book called Sky Color by Peter H. Reynolds. Sky Color. Marisol was an artist. She loved to draw and paint. She even had her very own art gallery. Not all of her artwork hung in a gallery. Much of it she shared with the world. She painted posters to share ideas she believed in. At school, Marisol was famous for her creative clothes, her box of art supplies, and her belief that everyone was an artist. Yes, Marisol was an artist through and through. So when her teacher told the class they were going to paint a mural for the library, Marisol couldn't wait to begin. The classroom buzzed with the sound of brainstorming. <clears throat> the students talked and sketched. Together, they made a great big drawing. <clears throat> then they marched to the library. I'll paint a fish. I'll paint one too. I'll paint the ocean. Marisol shouted, I'll paint the sky. Marisol rummaged through the box of paint, but could not find any blue. How am I going to make the sky without blue paint? The bell rang and it was time to put their brushes down for the day. As she climbed aboard the bus, Marisol kept wondering. All the way home, she stared out the window. The sun lowered closer to the horizon. Later at home, Marisol watched day turn into night. That night, Marisol settled into a deep dream. She drifted through the sky, swirling with colors. The colors mixed, making too many to count. In the morning, Marisol stood waiting for the bus in the rain. The sky was not blue. She smiled. At school, Marisol raced to the library. She grabbed a dish and began adding colors. This one, that one, she swirled the brush to make an altogether new color. Marisol then began painting the wall. A boy asked, what color is that? That, Marisol said, that is sky color. And that, my friends, is sky color. I hope you enjoyed. Hey, boys and girls, because of our awesome snow day on Monday, I want to read you my favorite book, Snow, by Roy McKee and P.D. Eastman. Snow, 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 come out in the snow. Snow, snow, just look at the snow. Come out, come out, come out in the snow. I want to know if you like snow. Do you like it, yes or no? Oh yes, oh yes, I do like snow. Do you like it in your face? Yes, I like it any place. What is snow? We do not know, but snow is lots of fun, we know. What makes it snow? We do not know, but snow is fun to dig and throw. Snow is good for me and you, for men and women, horses too. Snow is good 
It makes you slide. It lets you give your dog a ride. Snow is good for making tracks and making pictures with your backs. We go uphill, the snow is deep. We can't go fast, the hill is steep. We think our dog has gone to sleep. So is mine. Miley, Miley. <gasps> but then we get up top at last, then down we come, we come down fast. Sometimes we put on long, long feet and walk up every hill we meet. Downhill we fly, downhill we sail. Our dog sails after on his tail. What a silly thing to do. Are your feet too long for you? Come on, get up, get on your way. We have a lot to do today. Now take some snow and make a ball. A lot of snowballs make a wall. Put on more snowballs one by one. Our house of snow will soon be done. Do you like bread? Do you like meat? Come in our house, come in and eat. Snow is lots of fun, all right? It gives you a big appetite. We had our bread, we had our meat. Some bread is left for birds to eat. Now make another ball of snow. Push it, push it, see it go. What a snowball, see it grow. See it grow and grow and grow. What will we make? Let's make a man. Let's make the biggest man we can. We will call our snowman Ned, but first he has to have a head. His head will have to have a hat. His hat is on, just look at that. He is so big, he's so tall. He is the biggest man of all. The sun, that sun, it came out fast. Do you think Ned is going to last? Uh-oh. Keep that sun away from Ned. That sun is going to his head. The biggest snowman of them all is very, very, very small. Oh no. The way that sun is coming down, there soon will be no snow in town. Take some, save it from the sun. Take all you can and run, run, run. The snow out there will come and go, but snow will keep in here, we know. So we will put the snow away and play with it some other day. The end. There's a lot of snow out there, so I hope my friends have lots of fun building snowmen and having snowball fights, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Hi, friends. Today I'm going to read I Know a Shy Fellow Who Swallowed a Cello by Barbara S. Gariel, illustrated by John O'Brien. Let's find out. I know a shy fellow. 
who swallowed a cello. I don't know why he swallowed a cello. Perhaps he'll bellow. I know a shy fellow who swallowed a harp. Not so sharp to swallow a harp. He swallowed the harp to jam with the cello. I don't know why he swallowed the cello. Perhaps he'll bellow. I know a shy fellow who swallowed a sax. Hard to relax when you swallow a sax. He swallowed the sax to jam with the harp. He swallowed the harp to jam with the cello. I don't know why he swallowed the cello. Perhaps he'll bellow. I know a shy fellow who swallowed a fiddle. No time to twiddle when you swallow a fiddle. He swallowed the fiddle to jam with the sax. He swallowed the sax to jam with the harp. He swallowed the harp to jam with the cello. I don't know why he swallowed the cello. Perhaps he'll bellow. I know a shy fellow who swallowed a cymbal. Not so nimble to swallow a cymbal. He swallowed the cymbal to jam with the fiddle. He swallowed the fiddle to jam with the sax. He swallowed the sax to jam with the harp. He swallowed the harp to jam with the cello. I don't know why he swallowed the cello. Perhaps he'll bellow. I know a shy fellow who swallowed a flute. That was a hoot to swallow a flute. He swallowed the flute to jam with the cymbal. He swallowed the cymbal to jam with the fiddle. He swallowed the fiddle to jam with the sax. He swallowed the sax to jam with the harp. He swallowed the harp to jam with the cello. I don't know why he swallowed the cello. Perhaps he'll bellow. I know a shy fellow who swallowed a kazoo. Strange thing to do, swallow a kazoo. He swallowed the kazoo to jam with the flute. He swallowed the flute to jam with the cymbal. He swallowed the cymbal to jam with the fiddle. He swallowed the fiddle to jam with the sax. He swallowed the sax to jam with the harp. He swallowed the harp to jam with the cello. I don't know why he swallowed the cello. Perhaps he'll bellow. I know a shy fellow who swallowed a bell, the teeniest, tiniest, petite cascabel. His belly wiggled, his belly did shake. It rumbled and tumbled, it quivered and quaked. It rocked and it rolled, it swiveled and swelled, all on account of that wee little bell. He belched and he burped, he turned his shades of yellow. It seemed he was doomed, that very shy fellow. He weaved and he wallowed and he stomped and he yelled. And the next thing he knew, out jingled the bell. Out buzzed the kazoo, out tooted the flute, out crashed the cymbal, the noisy galoot. Out flashed the fiddle, out sizzled the sax, out strummed the harp, he played to the max. Well, he bellowed that fellow, that fellow did bellow. Ah! And last but not least, out cha cha the cello. The end. Hey friends, it's Miss McCoy here. Um, today I'm going to read a book called Salt and His Shoes, Michael Jordan in Pursuit of a Dream. Written by Dolores Jordan, Roslyn M. Jordan, and illustrated by Kadir Nelson. Hope you guys enjoy.
Michael loved to play basketball. Every Saturday, he followed his older brothers, Larry and Ronnie, to the park, hoping that they would let him play. And if one of the guys who usually played with them didn't show, they usually did. But there was one problem. His name was Mark, and he was the tallest boy on the court. What's the matter, Mikey? Too short? Mark flapped his arms in Michael's face. Over here, shouted Larry. But when Michael threw the ball, Mark's long arms came out of nowhere and knocked the ball away. It flew into the hands of a player on Mark's team. He made the basket, and the game was over just like that. I am really sorry, guys. If I were taller, that wouldn't have happened. All the way home, Michael apologized, even though nobody was mad at him. His oldest brother, Ronnie, tried to cheer him up. Look, little brother, you played really good today. Don't worry, we'll win next time. When they got home, Michael went into the kitchen where Mama was cooking dinner. He was still disappointed and she could tell. You guys lost again today, huh? Michael nodded. He sat quietly for a minute and then said, Mama, how can I grow taller? Now, Mama knew the answer to a lot of questions, but this was a tough one. She thought for a moment as she sprinkled salt and pepper on the chicken she was making for dinner. Then she smiled, look at, looked at Michael, and said, salt. Salt? Michael looked at his mama. Salt in your shoes. Well, put salt in your shoes and say a prayer every night. Before you know it, you'll be taller, she replied. Salt in my shoes? Michael said quietly to himself. Surely Mama was teasing. He sat staring out the window trying to figure out how salt was going to help him grow. He noticed the rose bushes outside in Mama's garden. They had grown high along the fence and roses of all colors were blooming on the vines. He thought to himself, I remember when Mama first planted those bushes. Michael's face lit up. If Mama knows how to make those rose bushes grow taller, then maybe she's right. Maybe salt in my shoes will really help me grow. Growing more excited, Michael twirled around and started asking lots of questions. Mama, how long will it take? And how tall do you think I'll get? Smiling, Mama sat down next to him and explained. In order for this to work, the most important thing you have to do are be patient, listen to what I tell you, and say your prayers every night. Listening carefully, Michael shook his head. Okay, Mama, I'll be patient, but what does saying my prayers have to do with it? Everything, replied Mama, and she hugged him. Now go wash up and tell your brothers and sisters to get ready for dinner. Michael dashed out of the kitchen, almost knocking over his father who was walking in. What's he up to now, asked Daddy. Oh, the usual, laughed Mama, chasing a dream. Later during dinner, Mama noticed Michael was barely eating anything. He was already daydreaming about being taller. Michael, first things first, you won't grow if you don't eat, especially your vegetables, Mama said. But I'm not really hungry, he said. Raising her eyebrows, Mama gave him a stern look. Slowly, Michael picked up his fork and began to eat. Minutes later, his plate was clean and he was asking for more. That evening at bedtime, Michael set his favorite game shoes on the floor next to the growth chart hanging on the wall. Then he put on his pajamas, said his prayer, and jumped into bed. When Mama came in, Michael was fast asleep. By the look on his face, she could tell he was already uh, playing basketball in his dreams. Standing by his bed, Mama sprinkled salt in his shoes. Then she prayed quietly over him as she did with all her children. Dear God, please help Michael to be the best he can be and to give him his best in all that he does. And Lord, could you please make him just a little bit taller tomorrow than he is today? Thank you. Amen. After that night, Michael wore his favorite game shoes everywhere he went, even to church. And he stopped going to the park with his brothers on Saturdays. Instead, he stayed home and practiced. He wanted to grow a few more inches before he went back to the park. After two months of practicing and waiting patiently and praying, Michael stood next to the growth chart on his wall. Nothing. He hadn't grown an inch. He was disappointed, but he did not stop believing. 
I've just got to give it time, like Mama said, Michael thought to himself, and that's what he did. Two more months of practicing went by and still nothing. Now Michael was becoming sad. Not only had he not grown one inch, but he also missed playing basketball with Larry and Ronnie. About the only thing he didn't miss was being picked on by Mark. When the next Saturday came, his brothers tried to get Michael to go with them to the park, but he wouldn't budge. Mama had begun to worry. When she saw Michael sitting alone on the steps, she said to Daddy, maybe you should go out and talk to him. So Daddy went out and sat with Michael. What's wrong, son? You haven't gone to the park with your brothers for a while now. Are you okay? Michael didn't say anything at first. Then he looked at Daddy and said, I thought I would be at least a few inches taller by now. I did everything Mama told me to do, but nothing's happened. Michael, why do you want to be taller? Daddy asked. If I were taller, I'd be a great player, and I could help our team win, Michael answered. But you are a great player, son, and you already have everything it takes to be a winner right here. Daddy tapped Michael on his chest. Being taller may help you play a little better, but not as much as practice, determination, and giving your best will. Those are things that make you a real winner. Michael thought about what Daddy said for a minute. Then he suddenly jumped off and took off. Where are you going? Daddy yelled after him. I've got a game today and I'm late, Michael yelled back. When Michael reached the park, the game had started. He sat on the bench hoping he would get a chance to play, and he did. The game was almost over and the score was tied when John, one of the guys on Michael's team, fell and hurt himself. Here was Michael's chance. Michael joined his team in the huddle as they gathered on the sideline for a timeout. Okay, the game is tied. All we need is one point. Who wants to take the shot? Ronnie asked. He looked in Michael's direction. Feeling more confident than ever, Michael said, I'll do it. When the whistle blew and the game began again, Mark began to pick on Michael as usual. Still trying to play with the big boys, huh? Mark taunted. But Michael paid him no attention. Taller or not, he had been practicing, and today he was determined to win. Larry threw the ball and bounced to Michael. Michael caught it, bounced it for a moment, and then took off running. As he approached, as he approached Mark, Michael shifted to his right. Mark followed, but while he was still shifting, Michael spun to his left. He stepped behind Mark and shot. The ball arced far above his opponent's hands and fell silently through the hoop. Two points, the game was over, Michael's team had won. It was just as Michael had dreamed. When he realized what he'd done, Michael took off running and didn't stop until he had reached home. Bursting through the door, he shouted, I did it, Daddy, I did it. I shot right over the tall guy's head, and we won the game. Running behind him, Ronnie and Larry joined the celebration. That's right, little brother, you did it. You won the game for us. Michael remembered the look that Ronnie gave him during the last time out of the game and said, no, we won the game, but I was the star. They all laughed. After that day, Mama stopped putting salt in Michael's shoes, but Michael did not stop being patient, working hard, and praying. So that must be what made Michael grow to be a six foot, six inch tall basketball superstar. The end. I hope you guys enjoyed this book. Bye. Hello, boys and girls. I'm here to tell you a true story about Pierre the Penguin. Pierre is a penguin who loses his feathers and the staff at the zoo where he lives is trying to figure out what to do. Travis put on his penguin pajamas tonight to help us read this story. So let's hear about Pierre the Penguin. Down at the end of African Hall, past statues of animals, big and small, there's an aquarium wide and tall with real live penguins, 20 in all. African penguins don't like ice. For them, a warmer place is nice. Here comes Pam with fish in her pail. The penguins are fed twice a day without fail. Pam enters the tank through the sky-painted wall. A hidden door there leads out to a hall. 
Some of the penguins look just the same. Wing dance helped Pam call the birds by name. One day, aquatic biologist Pam, observing the penguins, saw one in a jam. Gently, gently, she examined Pierre. His feathers were gone. His bottom was bare. Pierre was afraid to go swim for a swim. He'd get too cold if he dived right in. How can I help you? What can I do? Pam had ideas and tried the first two. She tried a heater and the vet prescribed pills, but nothing worked. Pierre shivered still. The other penguins grew afraid of Pierre. He looked so strange that he gave them a scare. They brayed at him as he shivered on shore. They made him feel worse than he felt before. One rainy day, biologist Pam came up with a new idea. Shazam! My dog wears a, ram a raincoat, she told the vet. Could Pierre wear a wetsuit? The vet said, you bet. Pam and a friend worked day and night to make a pattern that fit just right. Then a wetsuit was made of neoprene, the tiniest one you've ever seen. Carefully, Pam put Pierre a, put on Pierre a wetsuit a featherless penguin could wear. Standing on a rock in his new wetsuit, Pierre the penguin looked mighty cute. He felt nice and warm. He wanted to swim, so what did he do? He dived right in. Now Pierre stood proud and tall, and nobody brayed at him at all. Six weeks went by, and then a surprise. Pam could hardly believe her eyes. Not only was Pierre no longer cold, he had new feathers. Observe and behold. Now warm in water, now warm on shore, guess who didn't need his wetsuit anymore? Pierre made a nest for his very best friend. Their story goes on, thanks to Pam, the end. So, Pierre the penguin had a wetsuit. Travis the dog has penguin pajamas, and I have my own penguin hat, all to keep us warm. I hope you enjoyed our story. Good morning, everyone. It's Mrs. Piccolini. Um, today, I'd like to read to you one of my favorite books by one of my favorite children's authors, Philip C. Steed. And the book I'm going to read to you today is Samson in the Snow. Uh, a common theme through Philip Steed's books is empathy. And if you don't know what empathy means, it just means appreciating the feelings of others. So let's read Samson in the Snow by Philip Steed. On sunny days, Samson tended his dandelion patch. Stepping carefully, he used his long trunk to pull up bothersome weeds. When he was finished, he stood in the sunshine, hoping for a friend to come along. Samson waited quietly with his flowers to keep him company. Hello, said a little red bird one day. Oh, hello, said Samson, making cheerful conversation. Would you mind, asked the bird, if I took some of your flowers for a friend? He's having a bad day and his favorite color is yellow. Yellow is my favorite color too, answered Samson. And he chose three of his best flowers and gathered them into a bouquet for the bird. Samson watched the little bird fly away. He wondered what it would be like to have a friend. And as he wondered, he grew tired. And before realizing it, before meaning to, Samson fell into a deep and lumbering sleep. He dreamed of the color yellow. While Samson slept, angry clouds came and covered up the sun. The wind began to blow and very soon all the warmth of the day was gone. Snow began to fall. It whirled around and around. Heavy wet clumps collected in Samson's great mass of fur till he was almost completely covered up. In Samson's dream, yellow turned to white. And that was when Samson woke. All around the world was different from before. Samson could hardly tell what was where and where was what. Every direction was white snow. 
Samson worried about that little red bird. I wonder if she's out there, he thought. I wonder if she's cold. Samson stared hard into the blinding snow. Oh, it's better to walk than worry, he decided. And so he did. Samson trudged through valleys and over rolling hills. The wind blew the snow into fantastic shapes, but Samson didn't stop to look. The little red bird's not made for this kind of weather, he thought. Samson swung his tail and stomped his feet to free the ice that clung to his coat. Excuse me, please, called a mouse, mostly hidden in a snowdrift. I would not like to be crushed. Oh, said Samson, I did not see you. You should not be out here all alone. I know, sighed the mouse. I did not expect a storm. I'm having a bad day. Would you like to come with me? Asked Samson. Grateful and relieved, the mouse made the long journey up Samson's trunk, past his vast ears, and under his thick blankets of fur. And there he kept warm. Are you comfortable? asked Samson. Oh, yes, said the mouse, very much so. I'm looking for someone, said Samson. She's very small like you. If she's small, said the mouse, then we should really watch where we step. I'm looking for someone too, said the mouse. I worry she's having a bad day, like me. I worry she's covered up in snow. The wind howled and the snow piled higher and higher. Samson breathed deeply in and out, in and out. He stopped to rest near an unlikely patch of dandelions. Do you have a favorite color, he asked the mouse. Oh, yes, said the mouse. My favorite color is yellow. Yellow is my favorite color too, said Samson. He reached down and gently plucked the dandelions from the snow. I found you, cried Samson. And I found you too, cried the mouse. The little red bird was too cold to reply. It's okay, said Samson. I know a place not far from here. And he tucked the little red bird safely away and continued on. Samson's passengers hopped down onto the dry cave floor. Thank you, said the little red bird, and she shook the snow from her feathers. And look, she said to the mouse, I brought you flowers. Oh, said the mouse, that's exactly what I needed today. The three friends huddled together and told stories of their adventures in the snow. And not long from then, the storm passed. The end.